Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for uh, having taken the time to come and listen to this. Uh, and uh, I just have one more question here before I start, actually. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to click on this video so you guys can see who, who I am. I'm sitting here in the Safe Drinking Water Foundation's office, and uh, and um, I'm in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And uh, we've been told, like, if we try to run the video at the same time as we run the presentation, uh, that is going to make uh, uh, the whole thing a lot more difficult. So. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn off the video and I'm going to start the presentation. Okay, so now we are kind of ready to do this. What I'm going to talk um, to you uh, today about uh, is uh, how we can use uh, biological treatment uh, ahead of reverse osmosis membranes and actually how you can use biological treatment uh, as a whole to uh, produce uh, better quality water. And uh, this presentation was made uh, at the European Desalination Society's meeting in Baden-Baden and uh, uh, Petter uh, um, set from uh, Oslo uh, and Maxit gave that presentation as I was not able to be there. And um, if you have questions, um, maybe it's better that we run the presentation first and talk about questions uh, after that. Uh, although. Uh, as we are learning, as we are doing this, uh, if you have any questions, maybe just type them out, and uh, I will. Um, okay, and and I will uh, try to respond to them as you type as you type them out to me. I just found out that apparently Lars was not able to make it, but Peter is there, so that's kind of good. So biological pretreatment avoids biofouling of reverse osmosis membranes. Uh, my co-authors are Robert Pratt uh, at uh, George Gordon First Nation, Tony Steinhauer, uh, Saddle Lake Cree Nation, Dan Hogan, who is an engineer, um, uh, is, uh, has a company in Saskatoon, DH uh, Engineering. Uh, Roberta Nyepetang is a water keeper with um, uh, Yellow Quill First Nation. And Robert Nepetang is that as well. And Thomas Missens uh, is a water keeper at the Pasqua First Nation here in Saskatchewan. Uh, all of us belong to the Advanced Aboriginal Water Treatment Team, um, which um, is designed to help uh, First Nations and other communities on how to treat uh, water. You can actually see us, uh, some of us, in the Advanced Aboriginal Water Treatment Team here. Uh, to the left is uh, Robert Nepetang, and then Tony Steinhauer, and then it's myself, and then it's uh, Bob Pratt, uh, and Roberta Nepetang is uh, to the right. And the Advanced Aboriginal Water Treatment team is composed of Aboriginal water keepers concerned with the production of truly safe drinking water with the help of science. And what we're going to talk about mainly today is the pretreatment of water, making it suitable for reverse osmosis treatment and how we can use even extremely poor quality source waters and uh, make it acceptable for a reverse osmosis to then polish the water to, to make it uh, suitable for drinking water treatment. So of course we are talking about uh, water that has uh, way too um, high of a 
uh, higher level of um, inorganics in the water, uh, for example. So desalination, seawater desalination, brackish water desalination. But uh, as you can see in this picture, we're also talking about uh, waters that have incredibly high levels of organics in the water. Uh, you're seeing here a sad lake, uh, which has 25 milligrams of dissolved organics in the source water. And uh, it looks ugly when you split it. So the bottom line is we have extremely poor quality water uh, to treat uh, requiring the removal of minerals and organic material. And reverse osmosis is essential for this. And our work is centered around how we can apply RO to our water sources. And you can see in the photo that we have uh, the waste stream and the, and the permeate stream. Uh, so we have waste streams with uh, organics level more than 50 milligrams per liter of dissolved organic carbon, extremely high levels. And you can actually see uh, Sad Lake Cree uh, Nation's drinking water supply here. It's, it is Sad Lake. And uh, on a windy day, this is what it looks like. So you can actually see uh, how, how the foam, how the wind has whipped up the foam and uh, made froth uh, for, for quite large areas of the lake. It's quite spectacular, actually. Now, other water sources have totally different uh, problems. And what I'm showing you here is Yellowquill First Nation. And they were picking up uh, water from um, Pipestone Creek, which only flows two, two, uh, two weeks, typically, of the year. Some years it doesn't flow at all. And is also uh, the creek that receives uh, an upstream um, uh, wastewater from an upstream community. And so you can see here uh, at uh, the Eloquil's raw water taken at the same day as uh, the source water of the city of Saskatoon. And uh, you can see the, ch the differences in. Uh, in quality that these two different communities, Saskatoon is a big city, and Yellowquill is a small community. And they are supposed to make safe drinking water out of very poor quality water sources. And here you have a picture of Canada. And uh, we are located uh, in Saskatchewan. And our work has been centering around Saskatchewan and Alberta, and to the, to the west of Saskatchewan. The treatment uh, that we need to come up with has to remove particles, including microbes, inorganic ions, iron, manganese, arsenic, ammonium, calcium, magnesium sulfate, sulfide, um, dissolved organics. And meeting guidelines is not the only goal due to the high levels of nutrient and energy sources in these waters. And I notice, you know, we have calcium and magnesium here, which is typically good, good uh, things to have in water. But uh, if your levels are exceedingly large, then then something has to be done about that as well. Um, so how do we deal with these types of water sources? And the traditional way uh, has been uh, to use a chemical approach. And whether for surface water, where we use uh, typically direct filtration, or groundwater, where we use manganese, green sand, etc., we use large quantities of treatment and disinfection chemicals. And the water is still not able to meet many of the guidelines. And here you can actually see what's happening at Sad Lake. Uh, uh, and they are using. Uh, a tremendous amount of chemicals every month. They are um, they are producing about 250 gallons a minute of water and using $15,000 worth of chemicals a month. And despite the fact they have a xenon ultrafiltration system, this community 
is has been under a boil water advisory since 2004, and the conclusion of the engineering company is uh, is that they need uh, much uh, tighter membranes and ultrafiltration, and we have done uh, piloting up at Saddle Lake uh, since 2005 on biological pretreatment to to the RO as well. And if you can see here, instead of using this enormous quantity of uh, chemicals that they're currently using, we anticipate uh, that to be replaced basically by a bucket of chlorine, um, a small bucket uh, as you can see in the foreground. And, uh, and uh, the chemical cost certainly will go down drastically and um, the quality of the water will actually improve extremely, uh, uh, in extreme as well. Uh, currently, they have, they can only get down to about 12 to, to 13 milligrams of dissolved organic carbon and uh, lead, leading to a host of different problems, trihalomethanes, inability to, to keep chlorine residuals in the distribution system. And with the system we've been working on, they will have less than half a milligram of dissolved organic carbon, which is very easily treated. So if you look at the attempts that uh, people are doing when it comes to treating this type of water, we've, we start with chemical oxidation. We can use air, pure oxygen, ozone, potassium permanganate, chlorine, and they react with the reduced compounds to form oxidized compounds. The, re the reduced compounds go from a lower to a higher oxidation state. For example, you know, ion uh, Fe2 plus goes to Fe3 plus. And these compounds are frequently not oxidized and they form particles. And the same happens if you simply just expose it to air or the above chemicals, they, it will rapidly, the water will rapidly become cloudy and with most groundwater sources we are working with here in Saskatchewan, uh, we will form between 100 and 500,000 particles per milliliter. So, and that's what you then have to try to remove with your filtration system. And often that, those particles are like dandruff very challenging to to remove effectively. And you can see here some examples of uh, chemical oxidation that uh, where, we, where we've done them. Uh, you can see again that we can have some extreme cases of particle formation. And especially if you go in and try to do some really drastic measures like ozonation, you, it, it will look uh, messy like this particular slide is showing. So, in many of our raw water sources, the water is simply too poor for chemical t treatment. Uh, the particle formation that happens uh, is time dependent and it is difficult to remove it uh, through media filtration because sometimes that particle for, uh, formation does not happen until the treated water reservoir. So now when you add chlorine, and we have to add chlorine in Canada to the water, when you now add chlorine to something that you've treated but not removed uh, most of the problems, you have not removed all the manganese and sometimes not all the iron, uh, you get post-precipitation in, in the treated water reservoir and, uh, and you can have, you can form uh, large uh, quantities of sludge in the treated water reservoir. And that also gives rise to distribution system problems and if you try to use these chemical systems ahead of uh, reverse osmosis uh, system, uh, then you will end up with problems with pre-filters clogging and membranes, membrane problems. You can see here how uh, we have some biofouling. Uh, if you allow uh, compounds that bacteria can use, 
and here you got iron as well. So you form a slime layer of uh, composed of uh, bacteria, and with whatever thing they have oxidized in this case, iron. And uh, here you can see uh, uh, this, these are pre-filters for Ross osmosis system, and you can see how they get plugged up uh, pretty quick. And uh, it can, in some cases. Uh, uh, replacement of pre-filters have to happen uh, within a hundred hours. So a hundred hours runtime, you got to change your pre-filters, uh, which is um, quite a challenge for operators to keep up with that type of stuff. And with poorly treated water, uh, the, while the warning signs in humans that result from drinking this type of water that has been poorly treatment treated. Uh, it can take years to show up, uh, but uh, if you stick in reverse osmosis after this type of water, poorly treated water, you end up quickly with problems. And we've seen that in many communities when they try to use manganese green sand and follow it with, with reverse osmosis, they rapidly uh, foul the membranes. And the type of fouling they typically get is biological fouling. So the bacteria form slime layers on membrane sheets, loss of productivity, even at low increases in the weight of the membranes. And it's interesting at George Gordon, uh, where we have manganese oxidizing bacteria uh, fouling the membranes, uh, that uh, they only increased about a kilogram and a half. Uh, in terms of weight, and now a full-scale 8-inch, 40-inch uh, uh, membrane, 8-inch by 40-inch, while if a membrane is fouled strictly with inorganic foul, and say an iron uh, in, in the membranes, you can anticipate to increase the weight of these membranes by at least 10 kilograms. Uh, so the reason why bacteria are so efficient in, in producing this uh, problem uh, is that you can think about it as you, you go and buy a jello or you, you, you buy something and, and uh, you add some uh, a spoonful of it and then you add water to it and it produces a gel and uh, uh, fills the whole glass with, with, with a gel-like substance. That's exactly what bacteria are doing they are forming this gel substance around them, so which may account for 95% of the bacteria, and it's just actually inside in the middle that you actually have the cell, and the rest is uh, mucilage, and very effective in, in plugging um, RO membranes, and uh, very difficult to clean off uh, when, once you have fouled the membranes. So. This causes decreased membrane life, increased maintenance and cleaning, and um, at George Gordon they needed to have three new sets of membranes in three years, and the time frame between every membrane change got smaller and smaller, uh, and it was down to eight months. And the other problem with this is that one, when you start cleaning the membranes and have to do harsh cleanings, uh, you very rapidly damage the membrane. So the quality of the treated water decreases, and after eight months, not only had the membranes totally fouled, uh, the, the quality was not acceptable either. You can see here an autopsy of a membrane at George Gordon. Uh, this is uh, done right in the water treatment plant, and it's rolled out there on the workbench. And like you say, it's not a pretty sight. And they, the one thing about this is that it's very uniform. Like, uh, and um, in terms of um, the, the uh, whereabouts in the uh, RO system you get this, you actually get it right throughout the, uh, uh, the system. So you don't, this isn't just happening on the first membrane in the first stage. Uh, with uh, microbial uh, uh, fouling like this, 
uh, with time you can expect it uh, throughout the entire system. The other problem that uh, arises in reverse osmosis system, as it will in distribution systems, if you distribute this type of water, is it gets into every nook and cranny you have. And you remember in an RO system, just like in a distribution system, you have corners, you have edges, you have lines that when you clean them, they really cannot be effectively cleaned. So you have the so if you clean even harshly, you have the seeds just sitting very close to the membranes just to reseed and uh, go on the merry way again. And here you can see how we cut it all up and how we also cut some pieces of the of the membrane and. Uh, we did a pilot test strip so that we could test this solvent against uh, a large number of different uh, cleaning regimes and, and to get an understanding of what is actually here. We even did some uh, microbial um, estimation, PCR, and found that uh, Pseudomonas mangan oxidans, uh, a prime manganese oxidizing bacterium, was prevalent uh, on the, on this waste side of the membranes, and we put this in test tubes, and then were able to uh, do a pilot testing on them to figure that one out. Now, when we talk about biological filtration uh, of groundwater, in particular here. Uh, we will never allow reduced compounds from becoming physically or chemi chemically oxidized. Therefore, no production of particles. Uh, that is an absolute key. And when you set up water treatment plants and systems, that is your number one priority to remember. Now, we have to add some oxygen to get uh, these very anaerobic waters suitable for uh, suitable for bacteria but the key is you will only add what the bacteria need so that the physical oxidation chemical oxidation is kept at the minimum uh, because the actual um, and I get to that later I think the actual head loss that you get from physical and chemical oxidation is more than 10 times greater than what you get from biological uh, removal. So think about it. If 10% of the water, if you are physically oxidizing, chemically oxidizing 10% of the water coming in, that will give you a, a greater head loss than the other 90% of the water coming in that is removed by biological treatment. That is the power of biological treatment, that we can have way longer filtration runs. Uh, we have no loss of these uh, dandruff particles as typically generated by chemical physical processes. Uh, so, and that accounts for then uh, a lot more stability uh, in terms of the filtration process. Uh, and what the bacteria do, they do similar things to the chemicals. They oxidize the compounds. They oxidize the ion. They oxidize the arsenic and the hydrogen sulfide and the ammonium. Uh, and they do that to gain energy. That's their, that's their purpose in life. They, they want to grow, and they need energy, and they need nutrients in the process. So, and the biologically oxidized compounds are stored inside the bacterial cells or in secretions around the cell, re resulting in this an order of magnitude lower head loss versus chemical processes. Now, you can see here uh, from Yellow Quill First Nation, uh, we took uh, raw water, let it sit for a while, and we also at the same time took a biofiltered water, and of course that's on the left side. Uh, we took some biofiltered water in 2003, uh, actually 2002, and uh, we still have uh, those bottles, uh, and absolutely they look uh, the same as uh, on the left side uh, now, many years later, seven years later. Uh, for, the, for, the, for the simple fact, in the biofiltered uh, water, we have removed all the compounds 
that the bacteria can use to uh, to live and to to uh, prosper. So this is biologically stable water. Uh, you you really bacteria has no chance of doing any more with it. And we can also see that in the treated water reservoirs, um, we put uh, biofiltered water in the treated water reservoirs, and that's where, sorry, in the for for the backwashing uh, only. So we have a separate chamber for backwashing, and um, there is once you put it in 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 there, it can sit there for a month because some plants don't need to backwash more than once a month. And all all the uh, indicators we're using is showing you put it in there and it stays exactly the same as it got out of the filters. So the transformation of anaerobic groundwater, water is pumped out of the ground containing no oxygen, which is anaerobic, and the reduced forms of many compounds as iron. Of course, the water is clear, and that's... Uh, as it just comes out. So it looks good. And at this stage, it is introduced into the biological filters where bacteria oxidize the iron and the, and the other compounds that, that I've already told, said something about. And the water remains clear. No particles are formed. That is the key with groundwater treatment. Do not allow particles to form. Then you don't have the problem in the filters of uh, the filters shedding particles or or and uh, causing other problems. So in Canada, uh, we started working on this in well, I started working on it in about 1997. Uh, but the first uh, large scale or full scale plants are not they're not very big plants. Uh, was at Yellowquill First Nation, which was commissioned in 2003. Um, and then uh, Indian Northern Affairs Canada was looking over, and Health Canada was looking over their Yaliquil data, and they wanted to have a couple of years under their belt, and uh, be producing exceptional quality water at Yaliquil, and they then felt confident that, okay, let's try it on some other types of source waters, and we went in to do it on Pasqua and George Gordon, and they were commissioned, actually, both of them in December 2005. And then it's been a bit of a lull since that time. And uh, now uh, uh, we've ha we have excellent data for all three plants. Uh, they've been performing flawlessly. And, um, and uh, we are now in the process we've just uh, they just built another one at Dakota Dunes, and there is actually a string of plants now as Indian Northern Affairs Canada is starting to consider this as best available uh, treatment for really poor quality gr groundwater sources. And as you can see, uh, the temperature here um, in the groundwater in Canada is, is not very high. Uh, it's uh, just below 10 at Gordons and Pasqua. Yellowquill is below six, and the one that was just done now, Dakota Dunes, is below five, and uh, we're working on Mosquito First Nation, and that is also below five. So very cold water sources, um, and they stay that year round. They're picked up um, from anywhere from 100 meters down in the ground to to uh, Yellowquill is at 300 meters down in the ground. So no change during the year. And here's just uh, projects for this year, Miskaugan First Nation, Mosquito, this is an interesting name, Mosquito Grizzly Bear Head Lean Man First Nation, that is the name of the First Nation, Dakota Dunes, White Cap, Sad Lake, and the size of the plants are now going up to uh, Sad Lake Green Nation, 500 gallons a minute, and uh, that is being produced 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. That's the other sign of biological filtration. You don't want to shut them down more than when you when you do backwashing. And here you actually see a new addition to George Gordon First Nation. Um, hard to take a picture because uh, 
to getting far enough from the filters to get them in the view here. And here you can uh, see Dakota Dunes. Uh, that was a retrofit. Uh, and most of the installations have been retrofit. So this is a manganese green sand plant uh, where simply the manganese green sand is being removed from the filters. And we put, of course, gravel and st stuff down for the under drains. And then replacing the uh, the uh, or putting a filter light material in, which is uh, the material we have been using. Uh, it's an expanded clay ceramic uh, material, and uh, is an excellent uh, place for the the beneficial bacteria that uh, always fins in w always are in well water uh, to attach to uh, and. Uh, uh, not uh, other types of material which we've tested as well, like uh, different types of GACs, have uh, problems with the fines being uh, discharged, and that can cause problems in the RO process. So, if you look at the effectiveness, and remember that uh, this is very cold water, uh, we have ammonium removals uh, greater than 98% in all of the communities. Arsenic removal is a little bit, uh, uh, in some it's uh, high, uh, uh, like at Gordon's. We start out with 80 micrograms per liter, and 85% of that is removed, and uh, somewhat lower in Pasco and Yellowquill. But uh, here you have to remember what uh, biological treatment is doing. Biological treatment is taking the arsenic 3 plus which is poorly removed by reverse osmosis membranes and is oxidizing it to arsenic 5 plus, which is very effectively removed by reverse osmosis treatment. So in all of our communities, we have uh, below detection levels, less than 2 micrograms per liter of arsenic in the finished water. Uh, and if you look at uh, the dissolved organics, um, we have quite low percent removals, but the percent the the stuff that we remove is actually the stuff that can cause problems in, on the RO membranes. Uh, this is the organics that can uh, feed the bacteria, uh, even if it's low. And it's it's uh, it by de definition it would be low because we are talking about water sources here that can be a hundred years old. So they have been uh, exposed to microbial action for a long time. Um, you look at phosphate, again, it's variable, but it's also removed 100% uh, uh, in, in the actual RO. Now, if you look at turbidity, uh, and we were just, uh, I mean, we always get uh, more than 98% removal had we allowed the turbidity to form. So that is compared to a sample of water that was allowed to oxidize. Um, now, I'm going to say something about the filtrolate uh, expanded clay uh, biological filtration material. Uh, it, the material looks like coffee grounds. It depends what which uh, but okay handle race what's happening okay okay we have a question and uh, I can uh, let's take that one right now okay Kamal can you ask the question. Okay, um, that doesn't seem to work, so uh, why don't I continue and um, let's just bring up the questions after we've done this. We are still, we are still trying to get this to work uh, better. Do you, do you want to just type your question, Kamal? Could you do that? And uh, okay. Uh, while we're waiting for for him to type that question, I will say filtration material looks like coffee grounds, depending on the quality that you have. 
Uh, it provides a hotel for bacteria, and by providing the right conditions, the ion bacteria will remove the ion. Nitrogen-flying bacteria will oxidize the ammonium, and uh, that's the bottom line for any biological filtration material that you use. Uh, that's what you'll be looking for. And here you can see um, how bacteria are attached to uh, the filter light material. And uh, it is providing different size of uh, pores. And the key in biological filtration is uh, that you also uh, will, will, will get uh, uh, the bacteria to attach at in the different uh, pores so that they have to be sufficiently large and uh, to, to be able to get into the pores. So if you have very large pores, it's very inefficient to use of space. And if you have very small pores, uh, it, it is also tricky because uh, bacteria are too big to get into them. Uh, we seem to have uh, questions coming up here. Uh, and. Uh, but then when we click on the microphone, they don't uh, come on. Oh, okay. Okay, here, good, good. Um, <clears throat> that's great if you can type out the questions, then we don't have the confusion here <clears throat> on how to deal with it. So the question from Kamal, what do you mean when you say particle, uh, 100 to 150,000 particles per milliliter? And um, what I mean is uh, that we use a particle counter, and we take the size in the 2 micrometer, 240 micrometer range, and count them. And that's the kind. Of, so if you allow the groundwater sources that we have, if you allow them to oxidize, say if you add chlorine or, or whatever, or just air, that is the kind of particle counts that you are going to end up with. And uh, that uh, is then what you have to remove with your, with your filtration systems. Now, we don't allow any particles to form in biological filtration. So that is the difference. So we, we don't see these particles because it is, it is, coming, it is, oops, it is coming in, but we don't allow them to form. And um, then Rayat uh, from Aventura in India had a question. We have results for the water where the temperatures are very low. Do we have any results which substantiate the claims in tropical climates? Um, in, in terms of biological filtration, there has certainly been some work also in, in warm uh, climates. And if you look, for example, um, at some nitrification and so forth. Uh, it, uh, I know Max, it has uh, um, one uh, place in China where they have about 20 centigrade uh, water to do nitrification on. And in general, if you have uh, a warm water, uh, even if we compare between, um, say, uh, yellow quail and uh, Dakota dunes, they're both uh, between four and a half and five and a half centigrade. Um, and compare that to George Gordon and Pasqua, which are nine and a half centigrade. You can do the same thing um, with a smaller amount of material um, at the warmer temperatures, for because bacteria are more effective at warmer temperatures. In fact. Um, Ole, when he came over to, to Canada in 2002 and realized that we were trying to nitrify at uh, around 5 centigrade, uh, he said, you know, you guys are not going to have any success with that because that's going to be too difficult uh, to do in real time and with the type uh, of, of process we had. But uh, we have been able to optimize that as well. And uh, or a, the, the bottom line, I think, is that if you give bacteria the right conditions, um, then um, 
you will you uh, and if you then continually give them the right conditions, which is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because the way we actually run the water treatment plants is that uh, we never allow the treated water reservoir to fill. Uh, so as you get uh, over 90% full reservoir. Uh, the process is slowing down, and in fact, at Dakota Dunes, it is slowing down automatically it, it, without operator intervention. It uh, simply just monitors uh, the computer, monitors the levels in the reservoir, and uh, adjusts the speed of the uh, of of the uh, uh, filtration process to to uh, assure continued filtration all the time. Um, then we have another question from Kamal. Uh, what is acceptable level of iron in raw water for a biological filter? At yellow quell, we have about 10 milligrams of iron in in the raw water, and um, then at Dakota Dunes, we have four and a half, and uh, so we have relatively high levels of iron and. Um, what you have to think about uh, is uh, um, what uh, the amount of material that you need, and uh, I don't think the the iron process, uh, the iron removal process, is uh, quite rapid. So uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, how what, what kind of levels are you talking about? So, well, so I, I certainly don't think that uh, the typical iron levels in groundwater there would be any any challenge uh, for uh, for treating uh, with biological treatment. Maybe we should try to. Um, okay, here we have a question from Peter Coxon. Just to be clear, these filters. Then are operating in totally anaerobic conditions. No, absolutely not. I'm really sorry if uh, I gave you that impression. Uh, these are aerobic bacteria, although the iron bacteria are um, can do both. Uh, what we are doing is we take anaerobic groundwater in, and we add a small amount of oxygen, uh, which the bacteria needs to start. The reduction, uh, the oxidation process of the Fe2 plus. So they need just a very, very small amount of oxygen to be able to uh, uh, start the process of uh, oxidizing the iron to Fe3 plus and moving the redox potential into positive territory. And uh, so, so uh, we'd like to see. Uh, there is oxygen in the filters. And I'll come to this uh, as we go on. You can see the, how the process is, uh, is designed in the water treatment plant. So maybe I should just sort of continue here. Uh, oh, now I've got another question. Um, Well, if you could type, uh, if you could uh, type the question, um, and um, and then we will continue here. The biological treatment uh, removes iron, arsenic, ammonium, phosphorus, bioavailable dissolved organics, turbidity, and sulfide. And here you can actually see how the process is designed, and you have the raw water coming in, and uh, you have a contactor uh, which you are introducing air, and then you have uh, the biofilters, uh, and then the RO uh, process. So I keep checking if somebody has typed in a question, and I'll try to address it. Uh, as soon as it comes up. So here you can see the biofilters at yellow quill, and in the background you can see the reverse osmosis. And the other thing common to this is that uh, you start um, 
your well pump is driving the entire system. Like at Yellowquill, the wells are five five uh, kilometers from um, from uh, the plant, and those well pumps are actually driving the process through these biological filters. Um, and it's not until the reverse osmosis pump, which is picking up um, which is picking up uh, the water and uh, sending it through the RO. So only two pumps, one the well pump and two the, the RO booster pump. Um, and Amit Kant uh, has the question is for surface water, BOD and COD removal in anaerobic treatment, um, can we use uh, filter light? Um, uh, I not sure. I I can. Uh, is this? And we are we talking now wastewater? I think we should uh, maybe uh, not try to address that uh, right now. I I would say the answer is yes, but uh, uh, I think we got to talk about that uh, a bit later. You can see here how. Uh, just setting the valves at the aliquil. Here we see the backwash uh, chamber. Uh, so it's very effective contaminant removal. And when you backwash, you backwash, of course, uh, the bacteria that are loosely uh, adhere to the to the particles, and they go with all the contaminants that they have accumulated. And in terms of water use, uh, you can expect, like at George Gordon. Their water use for backwashing uh, went uh, down by 97 percent. So they used 3 percent of what they used to run manganese green sand filters. And here you see the. This was the first. This was Yellow Quell, uh, the R unit pH contactor, and uh, there's been quite a bit of development since uh, since Yellow Quell. You can see the backwash pumps, uh, also at yellow, uh, sorry, the distribution and backwash pump. Uh, the distribution pumps are in the foreground. To the very right is the backwash pump. Now, the water is suitable. Um, another question for Rajat. Uh, I have doubt in tropical climate like India how effective would be the. BOD and COD removal using anaerobic treatment. Um, uh, again, I think um, we we need to talk to about that uh, later. And I I think um, if any biological treatment, um, I would say you will be able to to improve on the process using an attachment material. But I think this these are excellent uh, opportunities to. To set up uh, some testing and uh, and de and determine under what conditions can and can it not be used uh, effectively. Uh, so, water suitable for RO treatment. Uh, biological treatment of the water will remove bioavailable organic material and other microbial nutrients and energy sources. And distribution system and membrane fouling and cleaning requirements will decrease. Uh, drastically, and the biological treatment also produces a biologically stable, high-quality water for our treatment. Operational costs decrease, treated water quality increases, and the environmental footprint decreases. And we have some good data on that for George Gordon First Nation, where the community was saving about $100,000 a year when they switched from manganese green sun plus RO to uh, biological plus RO. Now here you can see I mean, one, one key if you know how your water treatment uh, is performing uh, ahead of an RO is to take a look at the pre-filters, the RO pre-filters. And if they are plugged and you have to change them quite r rapidly, you know that your uh, filter prefiltration is is not that effective, and uh, here you can see from uh, one of the biological plants uh, after three months the filters are looking 
almost like brand new and uh, with large volumes of water having gone through them. So here if we look at uh, yellow quail, uh, we start out with eight and a half to uh, eight and a half to nine and a half actually. Um, we in the bio treated we get that down to less than 0 0.03 and of course in the membrane treatment typically below detection. Arsenic uh, we we get it down but we also do change the arsenic to arsenic uh, uh, 5 easily removed and we are below detection uh, of arsenic as well. Uh, and we have some uh, uh, mass spec determination, uh, DCMS uh, determination on arsenic and it's uh, below that detection limit as well. So you look at the ammonium uh, also down uh, very much and phosphorus in the finished water in the membrane is uh, not detectable. Uh, turbidity extremely low and the RO again uh, it's actually below 0 0.2 with no better methods and um, total dissolved solids, we're getting that down to a very low level uh, and it is actually too low, you, you don't want to distribute that water and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Here you can see uh, Roberta Robert Yepetang in the middle and with uh, uh, helping standby operators on the sides, that's Yellow Quill First Nation and we take uh, an other plant, uh, Gordon First Nation, they change from manganese green sand filtration to biological filtration in December 2005. Uh, they had 10 filter backwashes uh, per day and it's gone to two filter backwashes every two weeks. 100 fil filter backwashes per, uh, per year in with biological treatment instead of 3600. Uh, the backwash water has decreased from to 0 0.4 million from 23 million liters and backwash labor has decreased from 40 to, to uh, uh, 14.40 and, and you guys that have, have your hands raised and that when I, when I have it yet, maybe put them down again or, or send uh, another question to me if you could. So that once, if I have answered the question, could you please put the da hand down? Um, and I don't see any, I don't see any new questions coming up, so... Uh, okay. Is there anyone? Oh, Laurie. Okay, I have, an, I have another question here now, and that's from Laurie at Sapphire. Uh, do backwash and time vary depending on the water? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, it all depends on uh, how much uh, stuff you're taking out, how rapidly you're running the filters, and uh, typically in a biological plant, we just uh, go for head loss and uh, when a, a certain head loss has been reached, then then uh, we uh, we uh, back the backwash the filters. So, and then I got another question here from uh, John Botha. Uh, what about manganese fouling of membranes? Uh, uh, or oh John? Uh, John, uh, that's a really good question, and. Uh, what what happens when you do oxidize the head of membranes? Uh, you you actually set up the biological conditions for manganese oxidizing bacteria to really thrive, and that's why you have a preferential manganese uh, uh, oxidizing bacteria fouling after say a potassium uh, after a manganese green sand or and I suspect after any oxidative treatments where you then uh, have an RO for groundwater anyways. And um, we um, don't allow the conditions where manganese oxidizing bacteria would thrive to occur in, in our filters. And uh, so the bottom line is uh, 
we we don't get any uh, manganese um, oxidizing uh, fouling. And if we look at, for example, we can take Pasqua First Nation. Uh, they have run since December uh, 2005, and uh, the RO membrane has not increased in pressure uh, 10% or the permeate has not decreased 10% uh, since uh, 2005 and uh, the conductivity of the combined permeate is identical now as it was in 2005 and we have never had to clean the membrane so that gives you an indication uh, how benign uh, biological treated water is uh, when you have it uh, ahead of membranes. I have another question from Amit Khan. How much organic load can be removed per cubic meter of uh, filtralite? Um, I think we're still talking very much wastewater here, and we are trying to to talk about uh, uh, drinking water treatment. Um, so I, again, Amit Khan, I think we need to have that in another session. Um, and uh, Johan, uh, how often replacing filtration media? I don't know. Uh, it's going to be a long time. Uh, we uh, uh, we started we ran Yellowquins since 2003, and uh, the attrition rate of, of of the filter light material is very low, and uh, I certainly anticipate absolutely zero problem for 10 years. And uh, I would, I would, uh, if I were a betting guy, I would say we should be able to run for 20 years without uh, being concerned about the uh, material. Now, if you use some of the lighter materials that filter light is producing, um, then then you have to be quite careful when you do your backwashing, so that you don't uh, move the material out of the filters. I mean, that would then, of course, require you to replace them more often. Uh, but uh, in terms of attrition, how it degrades and everything else, uh, I think you can count on uh, well over 10 years, so that shouldn't be a problem. Um, so at Gordon First Nation, the they actually ended up cleaning. Uh, okay, I have one more question here. Okay, uh, from Johan, can you give an indication of the footprint based on flow? Um, for you know, I can, but I cannot uh, off off the top of my head uh, do it. But uh, I can tell you that if you have a properly designed manganese manganese green sand treatment plant um, uh, that is also would need an RO, you you will have no more uh, requirement for any bigger footprint. So uh, you had you use typically the same type of uh, filters. And they are no bigger than what you anticipate using for any conventional treatment system to treat the, the water that you have. So, in terms of footprint, uh, very much the same as what you expect from a conventional plant. Um, at the George Gordon, uh, weekly RO cleanings, they are no longer necessary uh, because they went to biological treatment. and. Um, now they require membrane cleanings less than once per year, and no need to replace our membranes every eight months. We anticipate 10 years uh, duration for the membranes. Uh, no membrane damage. Uh, biological treatment requires no chemicals. Antiscalant requirements have also been decreased. And switching to biological treatments has resulted in cost savings of more than 100,000 per year for this community, or 12. 100 people. Um, now I've got a whole string of questions, um, so that's good that uh, we get these. Um, Kamal, uh, what are the key factors which affects the development of biofilm? Um, the, the, the key thing is what is it you're trying to do? Uh, are you trying to encourage um, iron bacteria to remove the iron? Are you are trying to encourage nitrifying bacteria to remove, you know, it all depends. And you've got to set up the conditions that are favorable for whatever you'd like to do. So uh, it, it's all it's different from 
depending on what you have in the water and what you're what you're trying to achieve. Uh, do you need a biological filter if you can send anaerobic recorded directly to the RO? Well, that's a really good question, Johan, uh, and I have some strong views on that one. Um, yes, you can send um, uh, water directly to an RO, uh, and um, your success is certainly going to depend that you need to keep that water anaerobic the entire time. And um, what we've seen with those types of systems is that the pre-filters frequently get uh, plugged so that you need to uh, change the pre-filters often. And if you then look at the pre-filters, what was stuck on the pre-filters, if, if you then think what, what that stuff was oxidized and that's why it's stuck on the pre-filters. But uh, the stuff that didn't oxidize did go into the RO membrane, and if you if you get some of those compounds getting stuck in the RO membranes, you certainly also can have uh, anaerobic growth of bacteria in 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 the membranes. And the systems that we've looked at uh, that uh, are using the, these technologies uh, have had problems with damage to the membranes. Uh, ammonium, uh, if you have ammonium in the water, ammonium going through, arsenic going through. So you, if you are going that route, you've got to pay particular attention to ammonium, which Health Canada now finally has decided is a concern. I know you guys in India, that's been a concern in India for a long time. And uh, if you have 0 0.3 milligrams of ammonium in the water, you need 5 milligrams of chlorine to get rid of it and get breakpoint. And uh, we have communities for yellow quill has over 4 milligrams per liter. You need 60 milligrams of chlorine to get rid of that uh, uh, if you use chlorine. So totally totally unacceptable. And if you have ammonium residuals in your water after chlorination, you have not disinfected your water properly. And Health Canada is finally admitting that they are not. So so those are some of the concerns that I have with uh, if you send anaerobic water directly to the RO. Um, you, you keep the arsenic as arsenic-3, and it's very poorly removed by RO between 5 and 60% of the arsenic will be re removed. Uh, so you've got to watch what level do you have there. And you've got to remember that Canada has gone from 50 micrograms per liter to 25 micrograms per liter to 10 micrograms per liter in terms of arsenic. And Health Canada wanted to go to 5 micrograms per liter, but there were too many provinces that protested. So. And the US EPA has said they'd like to see arsenic in the submicron range. So here you have a compound that is certainly uh, it's going to be a challenge as I get tighter and tighter specs for that. Uh, Kamal, are we talking about aerobic filters or anaerobic filters when we say biological filters? We are talking aerobic filtration here, Kamal. Uh, but uh, only adding enough air for the bacteria to do to do their job, so not excessive amounts of air. That that is one of the key points of this whole thing, is that you add only only what the bacteria need, and not so that you get oxidation in, in uh, other me uh, by other means. Well. Uh, I have uh, when it's water to be regarded as uh, anaerobic, DO concentration must be at which concentrations. Actually, for uh, iron removal, you need uh, quite low uh, and sometimes uh, barely measurable levels of oxygen, so you don't need very large uh, levels of, of oxygen. Uh, okay. And here you can see the George Gordon biofilters, and they actually saw the other picture was they got a major expansion to the plant, and uh, that was just happening uh, this year. And here you see the RO, they're running two RO units. Uh, 
if we look at uh, George Gordon bioremovals, you know, iron, we take it down to to uh, very low levels, arsenic to about uh, less than point zero one five, ammonium down, ph phosphorus down, and dissolved organics again, just a small amount. Uh, manganese we don't touch, we take that out by the membrane, total dissolved solids, um, we don't touch that of course in the biological treatment, uh, and and uh, we take it out in the uh, uh, RO. Um, I got another question from Rayat, uh, we, the biofilters we are talking about are aerobic, yes indeed. Yeah, and Lori agrees with me, so that's good. And here you see this is Bob Pratt, he's a water treatment operator and circuit writer for Touch with Tribal Council. Um, here at George Gordon First Nation, uh, he's a member of the Advanced Aboriginal Water Treatment Team, as all of us are, that were listed as the authors. Uh, the integrated biological and RO treatment process. Uh, now, biological filtration can only remove compounds that are either a nutrient or an energy source to bacteria. The goal is to remove all such compounds so that no further bacterial growth can occur in the membranes or distribution system. That is the, the entire treatment. Uh, in terms of the goals, what we are doing, because we have exceedingly poor quality water. Of course, biological treatment can be used as a standalone, just like any conventional treatment uh, can be used as a standalone on water that is not as poor as what we are dealing with here. Um, and the reverse osmosis membrane treatment will then remove most compounds without plugging or fouling. And after membrane treatment, it's desirable to add calcium and magnesium back into the water. Like frequently um, in um, after ROs, uh, we uh, pH adjust using uh, sodium uh, hydroxide. Um, now, when you do that and you get uh, pH above seven, um, then um, then that water is still corrosive. And if you do that, you should add a corrosion control inhibitor, and that's not always done. Uh, but in addition, you do add sodium to the water, so which, from a human health perspective, is not that great. And um, so, therefore, at Yellow Quill, where we where we did originate this process, uh, the band decided that they did not want sodium in the water; they wanted calcium and magnesium. And uh, that's when we designed a uh, contactor of calcium and magnesium uh, mineral contactor. So the oral water picks up calcium and magnesium, and that is non corrosive water. So that will not pull copper and lead out of distribution systems. Uh, so the reverse osmosis membrane treatment then remove the remainder of the issues, manganese and any remaining ammonium and arsenic ions, uh, dissolved organic carbon, and remember with the arsenic ions we had it as arsenic-5, almost 100% removal by RO membranes, whereas arsenic-3+, plus, we have only between 5 and 60% removal, so if you do, do, do that, uh, uh, then, then you have to really watch the level of arsenic in your raw water. Dissolved organic carbon, the very small part that bacteria can use, and any any remaining particles. While you know, we always run a one micron particle filter ahead of the RO units, and like I said, uh, we could go likely for six months without replacing uh, those uh, pre-filters. But the, the, but the pre-filters are cheap and uh, the operators like to do something, so uh, they either decide that they're going to remove them every three months or every four months, so they uh, have a few removals per year. And uh, dissolved solids, including calcium, magnesium, manganese, sulfates, and nitrates, and they all remove, which 
you know, we are talking reverse osmosis, and we are talking tight RO, so we get uh, TDS levels that are typically below uh, 15 milligrams per liter or so. And uh, then we are picking up uh, total dissolved solids, we are picking up calcium, we're picking up magnesium um, through the mineral bed, so making it suitable for human consumption again. So if you look at the tap water at the Aliquil, uh we have the ammonium, uh, yeah, we have no ammonium, of course. Arsenic, we have below detection, dissolved organic, below detection, um, uh, heterotrophic plate count, below detection, iron levels extremely low, um, manganese extremely low, uh, nitrate, there is some nitrate at uh, at uh, Yellow Quell, but uh, remember uh, we had more than four milligrams of ammonium, so we are converting all of, uh, or we're converting it to nitrate, and it, uh, the bugs also take up some of the nitrogen in, into the biomass, uh, and there is uh, an RO membrane is good, but it's not perfect for removing nitrate, uh, so there is some nitrate uh, when you use a water that has high ammonium levels, uh, but we are still uh, 20 times below the Canadian guidelines for nitrate. So, uh, sulfate very low, trilomethane is below detection. Uh, so, in the tap water, here's a, I think an interesting slide. Um, like the D, uh, WHO is uh, because of the increased use of oral membranes for seawater desalination and for groundwater treatment and, and so forth, uh, they were quite concerned about uh, strictly just going in there and using sodium hydroxide to pH adjust and uh, and, and uh, they're concerned that, you know, we this is going to be done properly and they like to see alkalinity is about 30 and at yellow quill we have 77. They like to see calcium levels below 20 milligrams, uh, above 20 milligrams per liter. At yellow quill we have 23. Uh, they like to see hardness levels above 60, and we have 76. This is still very soft water, but we have some hardness in there. They like to see mag magnesium levels above 10. When this uh, sample was taken, we had 4.6 milligrams but we've changed the combination of calcium, magnesium, mineral. We've increased the magnesium content, so now we are up close to 10. And they like to see a TDS above 100, and we are close to that. And with the changes in the magnesium, we should be above 100 too. So, so not only is this water meeting guidelines in terms of health, in terms of uh, safety and so forth, but we are also aiming to meet the WHO uh, recommendations. So my conclusion here is that uh, biological treatment can replace conventional treatment with little need for chemicals, and following the biological treatment reverse osmosis, uh, treatment can make salt water drinkable. Uh, distributed water is biologically stable, that is, there is little opportunity for bacteria to grow in the distribution system, and there is virtually no chlorine demand. Chlorine levels at treatment plants similar to distribution end. And life cycle costs are much reduced. Um, Kamal has a question. I don't know if I can go back here. Just a sec. Uh, uh, Kamal, if you uh, are going to do hardness from magnesium and calcium, you have to apply uh, different factors. You cannot uh, simply add them. And uh, so, and it's different factor for each calcium, and it's a different factor for magnesium. I can send that to you afterwards, but I certainly don't know those numbers off by heart. You actually got, a, I think magnesium is, you got to multiply by two or something, or by three, and I think calcium by two or something like that, uh, to get those numbers. And, um, 
here's our organization, safewater.org, and uh, we thank our sponsors, which is the Canadian Superstore, the EcoTrust, RBC, and I'm sorry, I have forgot uh, one sponsor, uh, and that is uh, Sapphire Group. Uh, the Sapphire Group is now in Canada uh, <coughs> producing a commercial version of the Ibram system, and it is called uh, a Cybram system. And the first uh, such venture was uh, at the Dakota Dunes, uh, which uh, has now been successfully uh, commissioned. And safe drinking water is a must for healthy communities. And here you see George Gordon First Nation that used to be supplied with water with, that had high levels of arsenic in it and uh, real problems for the community. And it was, uh, uh, not, you know, for 15 years that was the case. And they got uh, the, the first RO in, I think, 2001. Uh, so, so uh, it's a real challenge if you are forced to to uh, live with water that is not acceptable. And Yellowquill was invited to present at the United Nations in April 2005. And here you see we were invited by the Indigenous Environmental Network uh, in the United States. And here is the Executive Director uh, on the left, uh, Tom Goldtooth. And, he, and Tom is actually now also on the board of directors of the Safe Drinking Water Foundation. And you see to the right, uh, Yellow, uh, Yellow Quills Water Operator, Robert Yepetang, who presented at the UN about uh, the progress we've done in uh, water treatment. And here you can see a powwow at George Gordon First Nation. and. Uh, all of these dances mean different things, but unfortunately, I'm not the one to tell you about uh, what they mean. So thanks for listening, and any questions? And I, OK, now we have some more questions. Um, Uh, how from Peter Coxon, how, <coughs> sorry. How do you monitor, control the amount of air added to the biological filters? <coughs> you, you you do we we use um, we do use oxygen probes and we use redox probes uh, to determine uh, the activity of the of the microbes in the filters, and we also do uh, of course ion testing, ammonium testing. Uh, phosphorus testing and a couple of other bits, uh, um, and uh, but it's not that onerous in terms of some some are not done uh, on uh, on a daily basis. Some are done on a weekly basis, uh, and uh, changes are typically um, happening um, quite slowly. So it's not that you you uh, have to. Uh, React uh, extremely rapidly to to uh, uh, to what's happening in the in the biofilters, uh, and of course for a particular treatment plant you can then uh, very much set up uh, the uh, the conditions and the valves and everything else uh, to be exactly uh, uh, ideal for for the treatment system that you are you are running, and in fact. If we look at valves and so forth, we have if indeed taking off the handles of some valves because once the system is set up, uh, uh, those are not the kind of changes that the operators are are having to do. Any other questions? Maybe we could try again to see if somebody couldn't ask some questions uh, with, uh, with a microphone. We, maybe we could have a dis discussion or something. Yeah. OK. OK, Kamal, we're OK. Now, 
Kamal, I um, I will let you ask that question and uh, uh, with the microphone. Hello, hello. Is it Nicole? Hello. Hello. Kamal, uh, you can just speak. We can hear you fine. Uh, so, so, but I got to switch. It's Hans, of course. I got to switch the microphone, and then uh, when you switch on your microphone, you can you can talk. And then after you talk, you got to switch your microphone off, and then I can talk, or somebody else can talk. Kamal, do you want to switch on your microphone and talk? It's a little bit like a walkie-talkie that. Uh, we can only have one person talking at a time, and uh, their microphone has to be activated. So, Kamal, could you could you try to do that and see how it works? Yeah, Nicole, this is Sanjay. Uh, my question was like uh, this: biological filter. Uh, do they need a backwash? And if so, uh, does does a backwashing required on a regular basis? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess I'm coming up as being Nicole the whole time here. Uh, I'm using Nicole's computer. Um, yes, uh, we you need to backwash uh, the biofilters regularly, um, and. Like if you take George Gordon, if you have now a drinking water plant, uh, that plant was backwashed um, twice a day, and he had five filters. So so he did ten filter backwashes a day, seventy filter backwashes a week, and that was reduced to two filter backwashes uh, a week. So the the microbial filters, the biological filters. Uh, they don't develop the kind of head loss that you get in in chemical oxidation, so they'll be backwashed a lot less. Uh, and um, typically, in all the plants we have now, the four plants, uh, you backwash the first filter once a week. You may backwash the second filter once every two weeks, and the third filter uh, we have some plants that go. Uh, three months uh, without uh, having to backwash them. So it all, it all depends. But yes, you need to backwash uh, them, though, uh, at regular intervals, even if they are a lot less than um, than uh, a chemical type filter. Okay, so now we go to Dom Bing, uh, who can ask his question. Yeah, hello. My question is, um, will the arsenic accumulate in the biofilter or even in the in the membrane of RO? Will they be again released or have the risk to be uh, released in certain conditions? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Don Bing. Uh, yes, um, whatever the bacteria have taken up, uh, will be within the bacterial cells. So the backwash water will definitely contain the arsenic. We did not magically uh, uh, make it disappear. So um, you you would then have to make uh, provisions uh, for, for that. Uh, and then we have uh, John Botha can ask his question, please. Or maybe John didn't have a, John, oh, no microphone. OK, I'm sorry, John. What inlet pressure is required for the biological filters? You know, that's a really good question. And uh, we have been working around in circles around that. And uh, we have started yellow quill at more than 100 psi, uh, and um, it it turns out almost to be a non-issue. Uh, 
uh, it's really what kind of pressures you want to have when you go to the membranes. And uh, we have now been running as, as low as uh, less than 50 psi. So it really isn't an issue. And, and uh, Roger is, has a question. Roger, do you have a mic? Can you ask your question? Um, what I was wondering is if uh, feeding an RO direct will allow nutrients to pass through the RO system that will contribute to the buildup of a biofilm in the distribution system. Um, thanks. Thanks, Roger, and I'm happy to see that uh, you guys in India are still alive and kicking. Um, uh, yes, will nutrients pass uh, through the RO, uh, an RO system if you feed it direct? Um, some nutrients will pass through, and uh, the ones that are particularly difficult to get out, uh, very small ions uh, like ammonium, is very difficult to get out. So. And arsenic 3 plus uh, is also very difficult to get out. And um, also, there, there may be some of the other ones that uh, can be problematic. But the real, uh, the real problem, uh, as I see it, is that uh, you are always running a lot of iron through uh, a direct filtration system. Uh, and iron is a real killer of membranes. Uh, if you actually look at your um, uh, pretreatment filters, uh, the cartridges, and and you have to change those uh, frequently, or when you change them, they look like the ones that I showed you here in in the, in, in my presentation. Uh, then you got to think about it because that is now iron particles mainly. We've done analysis of uh, direct filtration cartridges, and the major accumulation is iron. There is a string of other things as well, but that that is a major one. And iron, when it gets onto the into the membrane uh, again and form particles, iron really really wants to get out of solution and form particles, and they attach to the membranes. Uh, on the way side of the membranes, and iron, if you if you know, is a very good catalyst. So if you have anything, uh, uh, any problem that can be uh, catalyzed, uh, it will happen on these spots where uh, the the iron is sitting on the membrane. So any any even a small amount of oxidant, say for example in a manganese green sun, any very small amount of potassium manganese getting in there will will uh, uh, <laughs> will actually uh, cause uh, uh, a hole in the membrane and will. Uh, will uh, be a problem in terms of the integrity of the membrane and uh, and go into the treaty water. OK, Rajat, uh, I, I, I think um, you can you can uh, ask me the questions that you would like. Nicole, this is Sanjay from India. Uh, I wanted to know what happens to the biofilm after we have done the backwash. Thank you. Okay, I seem to get you guys' name all wrong here, but uh, anyways, uh, what's happening to the biofilm after we backwashed? Well, the whole idea, um, um, the whole idea here is. Um, that when you backwash, you like to reduce your bacteria load on the on on the filters. So what you're doing through biological filtration is that you you have bacteria rapidly growing, and uh, and when you backwash, you know there's only so much space that where they can grow and attach really strongly, and and they continue to grow uh, and attach to each other and so forth. And what you do when you backwash, 
you you actually move uh, move the bacteria that don't cling on as hard as the other ones. You move them out uh, in the backwash water, so you will still end up with a sufficient amount of bacteria that uh, that have. They, they are either sitting in places where 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 it is not such harsh conditions in terms of the backwash, and they will be plenty there to continue to the filtration and biological action process. And typically, in a biological treatment plant, we don't we don't even uh, filter to waste. Like we backwash a filter, and it's put right back online again. And uh, but of course we do have our own, uh, you know, uh, at at the end, you know. So uh, so uh, really, what you're doing is you're using the bio the the biological filtration material simply to to as an attachment material for the bacteria, and they will continue to grow. And when there are too many of them, you will get a head loss increase. And that'll then tell you time to send somebody out of here and do, do the backwash. Um, uh, and um, uh, Bill uh, from uh, Ontario, um, yes, are we providing email presentation slides? Yeah, we will also provide a, a link to this so that. Uh, you can, um, after this presentation, go in and um, and listen to this entire presentation. Uh, so, uh, and we have another question. Uh, maybe you can. Uh, uh, maybe you can. The next question is Rajat. Um, sorry if I get say it wrong here. No, uh, maybe you could ask. Okay, I, I may result. I can. I'll just read it out because I didn't hear you talking. Um, how do you design the biofilter based on the water characteristics? Um, well, we've been on this for two hours now, and I don't know if if you want to be on this for another hour. But I do know that uh, we're going to try to run another um, session. Uh, uh, that is uh, only a couple of, or a week or so away. So maybe some of the questions that you are asking now, uh, we could we could talk about that uh, when I'm hopefully giving a presentation to you guys in India. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, well, well, I think you know we have been at this uh, at uh, close to two hours now, and um, if there is a final question or so, uh, please uh, please raise it. Uh, and um, and if there's none, I think we got to really sign off. And I know it's terribly late in India and in China, so um, the, it's way past bedtime, I'd say. So. Uh, Maybe we'll uh, we'll we'll say uh, good night to uh, people in uh, Asia, and uh, uh, soon even good night to people in Europe. And uh, hope that uh, you will join us again uh, when we are when we are uh, running these uh, webinars to try to get uh, information out there on uh, the issues of safe drinking water and how to produce safe drinking water. And in the meantime, I, I hope. Uh, that you will uh, look at our website, safewater.org, and email us with any questions or uh, anything uh, that we, you think we can help you with. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye.
So how do we decide to download?